I just want to know, want to let you know this morning that how good the Lord has been, as you know that the Lord has been. Uh, very briefly, I, I, I became involved with Bridges for Peace for an, a number of years ago. But how I how that happened this morning, I'm going to do a little different, and I'm. Uh, this is a missionary organization that ministers in Israel and has for some 50 years and has a great reputation in Israel. But the story of how it came about and, and what has happened uh, during those years, I think I'll tell you that this, this, this morning. Um, <clears throat> now, first of all, I'm a rebel Scott from Nova Scotia. As our brother said, I, I'm the sixth generation in Canada, my ancestors, on my father's side came to Nova Scotia in 1817. And uh, I just mentioned, they, when they came over from Scotland, there was a lot of immigration to Canada at that time. And um, there were a number of families that came from the same community in Southwest Scotland. And they came to Picton, Nova Scotia in the, in the summer and spent the winter there looking for uh, land for where they would settle. My ancestor was a blacksmith, so he could have, it was easy to find a job. Anyway, they came to Canada. When they came, they had eight children already. A new baby was born to them that winter in, in Picto, Nova Scotia. And the next spring in, eight, in 1818, the three, three of the families that came together, McCl uh, the McLeods, the Carsons, and the Grahams, went together. They had come from the same community, so they went together, and they bought a grant of land from a military man. Now, in those days, the government of Canada used to give a gift of a grant of land, a piece of land, to military officers that they had served, and they didn't have much money to give. And so they gave them a grant of land. So the three families went together and bought a grant of land of 390 acres from this military man. They moved out 10 miles from Picto. It was a solid, just solid bush. It had been, it had been uh, delineated and they knew where it was. They had, there were posts and signs. They were a mile from the road. There was a road that, that went over the hills uh, from Picto to Truro and then on to Halifax. But in those days, they built the road. They made the roads on top of the hills because then they didn't, then there weren't hardly any streams on top of the hills, right? So they didn't have to build bridges if they went on top of the hills for the most part. So anyway, there was a, the road was a mile from them and they moved in that mile and they divided up the land. <clears throat> and my family took 100 acres of solid woods and with nine children of which one was a newborn, they moved into solid bush, just like your solid bush out here somewhere. And, and must have set up under canvas to start with and started chopping down trees and clearing the land. Amazingly, when I was doing family history work years later, we found in Scotland two letters from my ancestor from 1823 and 1825 that was mailed to relatives in Scotland and told about their land. And what they did, just for interest, when they had all these stumps that were still there, how you can't plow. So they had to do it all with hoes and dig it up. So they planted potatoes, they dug, dug holes around, around the stumps and planted potatoes. And you know, for, the <clears throat> for fertilizer, in the spring they went down to the river that was a mile, a mile south of us, and we had what a fish called Gasparo, which were up to about a foot long, came in by the thousands. They went down there and they caught them in nets, and they took the fish home and cut them in half and put a half a half a fish in each of the holes where they planted potatoes. That's how they started. And so, and so they, they grew and eventually they built a, they built a, 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 a house 
In 1840, between 1842 and 1844, they built the house that my brother has been in ever since. That our family, so that's, that's uh, uh, 170 years, 180 years old. Uh, that house is 180 years old and still, and still strong and active. So that's where I grew up. Down below us, a, a mile south of us, was uh, the Scottish Presbyterian Church. In fact, it was the first one in that whole area outside of the town. Uh, and our people went there. Now, the amazing thing, I want to start this story, is that of these Scottish people who were in a community called Millsville, three miles up the road from us, and the, there was no other church there until later they built one, but they came, those people walked those three miles to our place and then a mile more to church every Sunday, either walked or came with wagons, with buggies later on. But they went, they went four miles off and on foot to go to church and four miles home. And one of those families was a family called Young's from Millsville, and one of their young fellows, Luther Young, became a Presbyterian minister and went to North Korea for life. He went to North Korea and established churches, and quite a few churches grew out of that ministry. And Luther Young, uh, his wife died, his wife died when she was... Uh, when, oh, sorry, Douglas Young, the son, was only six years old when his mother died there in, in North Korea. And <clears throat> so these Youngs walked right drive, going to church, went right past our home, and we, I'm sure sometimes they walked together to go to church. And my great-grandmother married a brother of the Luther Young that went as a missionary. Douglas Young uh, then grew up started life in North Korea and uh, when his mother died uh, his father came home there was not much you, a missionary can do in those days when you don't have a wife there so they came home to Canada for a little while then he went back to he went back to North Korea and he married and he, he remarried a young missionary lady and continued for many years Douglas Young, they came home when he was 60. The boy was 16 years of age. And this, this is why it was so amazing to me. Uh, this Douglas Young became the founder of Bridges for Peace. And he's a relative of mine because my great-grandmother married his brother. <laughs> and I didn't know that for most of my life till I was retired back from uh, from Africa. I didn't know that from years that I, I'd known about the ministry in Israel and the, the college, the, the seminary that he had established, but I didn't know for many years that he was a re relative of mine. Come, I didn't even know he'd come from my own community. So it's amazing that when God led me to Bridges for Peace to be a representative, what a treat it was to find that they, the, you imagine the treat it was to me. The founder came from my own community and grew up only three, th uh, three miles from my home. So here's this, uh, briefly, it's the story of, <clears throat> of uh, Douglas Young, the, the founder. How did, how did this young fellow become the founder of a minister, of ministry in Africa, or I mean in, uh, in Scotland? Sorry. Scotland and Israel are both promised lands, but. Uh, well, <clears throat> I still make mistakes once in a while, not very often. You know, <clears throat> my wife and I have been married for 65 years. Mm. More surprisingly, she still wants to stay with me. <laughs> at twelve at twelve thirty, she'll be with me. <laughs> I and I was ordained to the preaching of the gospel that same year. I've been ordained to the preaching of the gospel for sixty-five years. What a what a wonderful 
treat it has been to serve the Lord. Very briefly, my wife and I served in West Africa for 29 years. Both our children were born in Africa, um, and both of them graduated from a missionary school in Ivory Coast. And uh, so then when we came home, we came home in 1983 to get our kids through college and uh, took up other, did other work. I was a pastor for of three different churches, uh, one in Saskatchewan and two in British Columbia. And uh, then semi-retired and having did, done a lot of construction work in Africa, uh, my wife and I managed high-rise apartments in, in Burnaby and Vancouver and, and Victoria for nine years. And in that time, I became involved with Missions Fest. And I have gone, I have been uh, involved with Missions Fest now for almost 35 years, and very sadly, because my, my leg bothers me, this is the first year in 35 years that I haven't been at Missions Fest. I was on the board of Missions Fest uh, for six years as well when I was in Burnaby, and it was a great treat and a lot of work, but it was, it was a treat for us. And so... Missions Fest has been in Vancouver has been very, very special to me. And there's so many, you know, so many ministries and so many leaders of ministry that we got to know. And it has just been wonderful to see that God has really brought the Christian church together in, in an unusual sense in the Vancouver area through Missions Fest. So praise God for Missions Fest. Then... <clears throat> But let's go back. How did this ministry happen in, in Israel? Bridges for Peace that became very respected in Israel. Douglas Young came home and from North Korea with his parents when he was 16 years old. He attended the same high school that I attended in Picton, Nova Scotia. And he, because of the, you know, the, the, the difficulties that you have in life causes your mind to be sharpened and things he was the, when he graduated from high school, he got the high, got the award for the top student in Nova Scotia. And you'll see in the, in, when, as, as the story goes on, how he, how, what a brilliant, really brilliant, intelligent man he was. He finished high school. He went to Acadia University in, in uh, Nova Scotia. And then he wanted to become a doctor. <clears throat> And he applied, he applied to become a doctor, but uh, <clears throat> it, uh, he didn't, they, he needed money. It cost a lot of money in those days, and there were very few grants and helps in those days. And so um, he, had, he had no money to, to go to for the doctor program at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And so he wondered what he would do. And then he met with his brother John, and his brother John said to me, said to him, the Lord has called me to be a pastor, and I'm going to Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia in the United States. And like a lightning bolt, God revealed to, to, to Douglas Young that he should go too. He was, married, he was married to a lovely lady from Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, and she wasn't a bit surprised when he said that he felt that God had called him to go to Philadelphia along with his brother to study um, <clears throat> um, He became a, st a student pastor, and interestingly, when I was just a young fellow, about eight or nine years of age, Douglas Young, when he was in seminary, came home and Pastors from the churches took their vacation in the summer and had someone fill in for them. So I was just a little shaver. Uh, Douglas Young came and he was the, the summer pastor of our own Presbyterian church where I grew up. So I had met him. I don't remember him, but I had met him in my own, in my own church. And then... <clears throat> So Doug became, uh, he took, he took a, a pastorate as well. And um, one little story is uh, that he and his wife, they were very poor in a small church. 
And uh, one Sunday after service, he found out that the seat of his pants had ripped and, and his, the, the thin cloth already of the seat of his pants had ripped and it was, he, he had no more suit. And they had to trust the Lord and they prayed. This was on Sunday. On Monday, he got two gifts, two checks came in the mail totaling $15, which was, you know, considerable money. But $15 came the next day, which was enough for him to buy a suit and have it ready for the next Sunday. <laughs> and Doug said, this is just a, an example of the Lord's provision. And, and, and so much God did that for him over and over. And he, uh, he, he in seminary in the States, he picked up, he studied Hebrew, and he studied Greek, and, uh, of course, and then, and then he uh, wanted to become ordained, and so he, he was called to Toronto by the Presbyterian leadership in Toronto, but D Douglas's father, uh, Luther Young, was a... Uh, very evangelical Presbyterian, and there were some that were not so excited about his father's evangelical stand. So Douglas went to Toronto and met with the leaders, and they discussed among right in front of, of Douglas how they could how they could turn down Douglas, which was also strongly evangelical, and not hurt the father, who was still a missionary in Korea. And so Canada turned him down and would not ordain him under the Presbyterian Church. So he went to the United States and eventually was ordained under the Evangelical Free Churches in the United States. It hurt him. It, it, it very much hurt him that Canada, Canada turned him down, as you can imagine. Well, then <clears throat> um, he became principal of a Christian academy in Kingston, Nova Scotia, and continued studies. But in his studies in the United States, he, he, was, he decided to study in the Hebrew and Semitic languages program. Huh. Please don't. I don't want that. Uh, he was, and in that, can you imagine, he had to study Egyptian language, Akkadian, Sumerian and Arabic, as well as Hebrew. That it blows my mind. And when he when he finished his studies and went to Israel, he was so proficient in these languages that he published a grammar of the Hebrew language and a Ugaritic concordance. Ugaritic is one of those old languages. He published a Ugaritic concordance that was printed by the Roman Catholic Church in Rome. <laughs> now, that's about eight languages. So you see what kind of a, a, a fellow he, he, he was. It's just amazing. Uh, he was very much jolted in World War II when he found that, you know, what the Germans, when he understood the Germans, he said that there were su supposed, Hitler was supposed to be a Christian. And the Germans had the soldiers had their belt with the word Gott mit uns on the belt. Some of you know that. What did that speak? What did that say? God with us on the belts of the Nazi soldiers. And uh, anyway, Douglas Douglas was very much jolted in his by by the by this attitude, you know, of of Germans. Nazis, Nazis killing the Jews. That hurt him because he loved, already loved the Jews. So then he, he was studying in, at Northwestern. He was, well, he was teacher, at, rather, sorry. He was teacher at Northwestern New Seminary, professor of Old Testament. And there he wanted to go to Israel. So he took a trip to Israel with a number of students, and that changed his life. How many of you have been to Israel? Not as many as I would like. I thought there were more of you have been to Israel, but it does. It changes your life once you once you go to Israel. There he is. It does. I I was uh, about three or four years ago. I was at a, a Jewish meeting in Vancouver. Uh, 
The, the Jews have a birthright program, they call it, and they, they send their young people, they choose young people of, of co in college and send them for the summer to Israel. And I was there, there were three of them who spoke, two girls and a boy. Every one of them said, you know, when I was, when I was uh, in high school, my Jewishness, I was just ho-hum about my Jewishness. It didn't mean much. But every one of them said, when I got to Israel and saw, and saw what was going on in Israel and learned something of God's purposes for, you know, in the scriptures, now they were excited about Israel. They'd never be ho-hum about Israel again. And it does that to us. <clears throat> uh, 2006, I was at Missions Fest on Saturday afternoon, and I talked to Doug, uh, John Housen, the, the director of Bridges for Peace for Canada. And he said, Alan, he said, I'm, I'm, taking a t I'm leading a tour to Israel in 10 days. He said, how would you like to go? Oh, John, I said, I would like, I said, I've, you know, I've, we've prayed for Israel, we've loved Israel, we've studied the Bible for years. I would love to go to Israel, but I'm a retired missionary, I got no money. So we left it at that. Later in the afternoon, I, I met the director of Canadian Sunday School Mission from Sardis, and he and I were friends. I was on the board of Canadian Sunday School Mission for several years, and, and I told him this, that John Housen had invited me for this program and this trip to Israel. And I said, well, and I said, you know, I just, there's no way I could go. We left it at that. That was Saturday afternoon, Saturday afternoon at Missions Fest, like right now. And Monday morning, he phones me from Sardis. He said, Alan, over the weekend, I've talked to several of my friends. We've raised $1,600 and you're going to Israel. Ten days later, I was on the, I was on the plane from Toronto to Israel. And on those, that 10-day tour, I saw what Bridges for Peace was doing. And when I came home, I said, John, I said, can I just be a voice, a reference person for Bridges for Peace in the Fraser Valley? And he said, go for it. Well, with my missions background and getting into churches, I was into 15, 20 churches in the Fraser Valley over, over the time. And, uh, present, you know, had our literature for Israel. And uh, two years later, I got a call saying from Bridges for Peace in, in Jerusalem saying, Alan, you're not a representative. You know, you're not a legal representative, but you're doing the work of a representative. If you'd like to come to become a representative, we'll pay your way to Israel. We'll give you a two-week concentrated course and make you a representative. So I was already after my third pastorate, and I was already over 70 years of age. I thought my ministry time was done, and I went to Israel, and then I had 10 wonderful years, 10 wonderful years representing Bridges for Peace here in the Fraser Valley. God, God, God is so good. I'm, I'm, I'm retarded now, but, uh, but, but I'm still here. They can't make me quit. So, so back, back to Douglas Young. When he made his trip to Israel, he became enamored of Israel. And he said, I want, I'm teaching here at Northwestern, but I would like to have a Bible school in Israel. We should have it in there. He made inquiries. He found Christian Missionary Alliance uh, denomination churches had a, a, a building that wasn't much used. They said, we will let you have it rent-free for five years if you start a Bible school here. Well, land is expensive, every, as you know, in Israel. So for five years, he started, uh, he, came, he took 20 students from the States to start with. He went there, and, and they were five years there in that school. And then their lease ran out, and the Alliance wanted it back. So he said, well, what am I going to do now? And <clears throat> then he found that there was an Anglican school in, in no man's land, they called it, in, in Israel, which was uh, between, the, between, the, uh, between the Jews and, the, and, the, and Jordan that was in charge in Israel. And th there was a, an Anglican school called the Bishop Gobat School, 
with nice, strong buildings, and uh, it was had all been shot up during the War of Independence. It had plaster, you know, three inches of plaster on the ground, on the floors, and the, it was all a mess. The windows were broken, and uh, but they said, they said, Douglas, if you want the building, we'll let you have it. You, you, we'll lease it to you if you will fix it up as it goes along. So he, they leased the building. He took his 20 students in, into that building. They cleaned it up bit by bit, and eventually they had room for 90 students living in the quarters. But at that time, again, this is a missionary story, which is why I like it. At that time, Israel had, they had cisterns. So the water came off the roof in the, in the rain, in the winter rains, into cisterns underground. But they had no city water yet, and they had no electric power. So one day, Douglas was out in the yard, and a man comes into the yard, and he said, can I sell you a water pump? Well, Douglas said, we, uh, we don't even have water. Well, the man said, if I can get you power, will you buy a water pump? Well, Douglas said, no, that's a pretty good deal. So he said, yes, if you can get me power, I'll buy a water pump. A few days later, the guy comes with his pickup truck, and he's got, he's got a quarter of a mile of, of electric cable in his, uh, in his, in his truck. He hooks, the ca he hooks the power up to the power box and the lights at the, at the school. He runs the power line, the line down through the trees, several hundred yards down to a power pole of the cities down in the, in the valley, hooks it up and they got power. Now he said, we have to get it out. It would be a good idea if this was official. <laughs> so a few days later, he called Douglas Young, and he said, come with me downtown to the power company. So they went downtown, and he, and he says to the, this man says to the power company, now, the school wants, a, wants me to clean out their cisterns. He said, I need a power permit for two weeks to have, to have power for my pump to clean out the cisterns. Okay, the city of Jerusalem said, we'll give you that, two weeks of power. And then he said, but can you give me a permit? I need a permit for lights because I have to see what I'm doing down there. <laughs> He's a smart guy. So, he, so they gave him a permit for two weeks for a permit for, for power just to, to, for lights to work when he's in the school. They ran on that permit for three years. It cost them $30 for the permit. They had free power for three years until the city of Jerusalem finally brought them power and water. Oh, the, then for water, they didn't have water either at the time. So what they did, they, they ran a, 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 a garden hose put together. They put a number of them together down onto a water source down in the valley as well and ran and got free water which dribbled water into their cisterns day and night for several years until the city finally put, put, put water in. What a missionary story. But, but <clears throat> then when the, uh, the Six-Day War came and guns were, were, were shooting and the, the, the college was right in the middle with shells falling, Douglas Young was called to use his van as an ambulance to drive all over Israel, all over Jerusalem, rather, to, to deliver soldiers, to take sick people to the hospital or wounded, wounded to the hospital. And so he did that all through the Six-Day War, driving with shells fallen in every direction. But praise God, he was, wasn't hit. At the same time, because they had this big, strong, you know, powerful building, with, with monster thick walls, you know, like they are in five and six foot walls in, in that in Jerusalem. The army brought them 60 people for shelter there and they fed them. They fed them, fortunately, it was only for the six days. But they had both Jews and Arabs in their, in their school buildings uh, to provide them with food and shelter through the uh, Six Day War. Um, the, 
the um, Youngs became very, very loved and famous in Jerusalem. Because, first of all, because as as a college, he he hired and invited the top Israelis to come and speak. He invited Orthodox Jews to come and teach teach the, the Old Testament. He had archaeologists come and speak about you know the the old sites. His students went out and on the, these digs and these different uh, Tel Hazor was one that they were that they dug in, and so they had a, a wonderful time. They had newspaper people and uh, and uh, education professors, all of these that came and taught subject, and the politicians like. Uh, um, I forget the name. Uh, Teddy Teddy Kolek was the mayor of Jerusalem. Golda Meir as prime minister of Israel. We were on first names basis with 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 them, and um, they were just loved. And one reason, two or three reasons for that. First of all, they loved Israel. Secondly, they were not afraid to speak it. They're not afraid to say that. Douglas Young, with his knowledge of Hebrew. Wrote, wrote articles for the newspaper supporting Israel when most people did not do that. And I wrote to a friend of mine in Israel who was a Messianic pastor one time. I wrote to him, I said, did you know about Douglas Young and his ministry? He said, everybody in Israel knows Douglas Young and loved them. Another reason they were loved because at Christmas and he's now, you know when you have the uh, the, the feasts of Israel, the Passover feasts and that, when we, we do that here now in, in Abbotsford quite a bit, uh, and Hanukkah and, uh, and others, those are long evening feasts. I mean, that's a three and a four hour in Israel. They have three and four hours for a feast, for supper, and, and, and showing what the feast is about. Douglas Young was no dummy. He said, we can do that for our feast. So at Christmas and at Easter, he would invite 100 or 200 people, to two, oh, even over 200 people to the school and provide a meal for them and then have a three-hour presentation of what, what we believe for Christmas and, and the resurrection of the Lord at Easter. So he's just a, a, using Israel's customs to teach and, and that. So with all these things, and then when he didn't flee the city, you know, during the wars in 1967 as well, uh, they, the, the Israelis loved them. He said, these people love us. They show it, and they don't run when everybody else, when there's a war on, they don't run. They stay and, and stay with us. You can see why he became loved. And so at the institute that he the institute that he had founded there, then <clears throat> I, I, I jotted this down, down the, other, the other night. Of, the, of his institute, the Institute of Holy Land Studies, it was called now, it's now called Jerusalem University College. And he said there are now more than 32,000 alumni that have taken courses at, at the Jerusalem University College. I went, I went through their staff uh, the other night. There's a st there are two, two of their staff have studied, have graduated from Trinity Western University, one of them from Miller College of the Bible that I studied at, and one of them from Briarcrest Bible College uh, in Saskatchewan that are, on, that are on teaching at the college. They are involved. There are 70 70 universities and seminaries in Canada and the United States and England that, that send their students to, to this college and seminary in Israel. I, I, I just recently, I was at our, our college, Miller College of the Bible, and one of their, their um, Old Testament professors graduated from his master's degree at, at Douglas Young's College there in Israel, and, they, and he is now an Old Testament professor. So uh, God uh, then 
God had, had used uh, Douglas Young, unfortunately, in a sense, but this was in God's own, own timing. Douglas Young passed away when he was only 70 years of age. And his wife, eight years later, they're both buried in the, in the cemetery attached to that Anglican school where, where, where he did. But the, for his, the way he was respected, let me read this to you. This is Teddy, from Teddy Collick. The mayor of Jerusalem said, the history of Jerusalem is a chain of periods of prosperity and decline, progress and retreat. During each period, a few outstanding people make their impact on the events which transpire. G. Douglas Young is such a person. And then the rabbi, Mark Tannenbaum of Jerusalem said, Douglas Young is a giant of his time. His long and distinguished career has left an indelible mark upon his generation. For Douglas Young has been a dynamic and creative architect in building mutual understanding between his Christian community and the Jewish people throughout the world. When the history of this pe period is written, Douglas Young's accomplishments will loom large, for he has almost single-handedly established an internationally acclaimed Institute of Religious Studies in Israel's eternal capital, and he has been in the forefront of those dedicated Christians who support the people and the state of Israel. So most of us, you know, don't know much about it. But Israel, as I said, all Israel knew him much more than Canada does. I found that the Vancouver Sun used to put our, his articles in their paper years ago, <laughs> a long time ago. He was published in Canada, but, uh, but you know, now we do. Unless I tell you about him, you don't, don't, don't know about him. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's for, uh, for him. Then, so when, when, he had, when he had taught in Israel, ran the college for 20 years, he retired and turned the school ministry over to others. And then he founded Bridges for Peace. And Bridges for Peace was to bring people into Israel, have them find out what, what Israel is all about, to learn to love Israel and support Israel. And, and that's what we have done ever since. So he is, so that's uh, for years now. So just briefly, Bridges for Peace now feeds over 22,000 people a month with food packages, um, <clears throat> tons and tons of food every, every month. We have, we have a, a feed a child program. When I was there, uh, what, uh, an interesting thing, but you'll see how the loving Israel goes. They'll go to a school like the Bet Shemesh school. Say, how many children do you have of, of um, immigrants, immigrants from Russia, or from Poland or from Africa. How many immigrant children do you have? You see, when they come as my immigrants into Israel, it takes them about two years to learn Hebrew. And they can't get a job if you can't speak the language. So when they have no, no, don't have the language, they don't have a job, they, get, they have about $800 a month welfare money but it doesn't pay for all their needs, and they're in de desperate need. When, when they fly in now, even the Israeli government brings them to our warehouse, and that when they come into Israel, we supply them new immigrants with a set of pots and pans, with blankets for, blankets for their apartment, with, uh, with school books for their children, and, and with, uh, with, with a Hebrew... Hebrew, uh, whatever language they, they study, but I mean, with a, with a Hebrew Bible, a Bible so they can study the Bible, which they perhaps never did before. So we went, we went to school, but they take, for instance, a school that says, okay, we have 20 children, like this happened at Beit Shemesh. We have 20 immigrant children that don't have lunch at noon because they don't have enough money to buy food. Their kids come hungry to school. Bridges for Peace says, we will feed them, and the school will give them a hot lunch if it's paid for. So Bridges for Peace picks up the cost for, for lunches for 20 kids, and for those kids, we, we buy their school books, because the books have to be bought. 
We give them a backpack to carry their books. We give them a voucher for summer camp. Now they're like the other kids. Now they're like the other kids. And they start doing better in school. So look, look what, what the gifts do. The parents love us because their kids now have food enough in school. Their kids are starting to do better in school because they're, they're satisfied and they're like the others. The school teachers are happy because the kids, these kids are doing better. I had a, a report last year of a school, one school that got an award for high accomplishments for all their students. They said, we would not have had that if Bridges for Peace had not provided needs for our kids so that they could be on that level. You see what I'm saying? When I was at the school, the, the, the principal of the school, the kids gave us a program and sang, even sang in English for us. They did some, they, they did some, uh, some dancing, Jewish dancing for us and all this. The principal gave a speech of thanks to us and gave us a certificate of thanks, which I have on my wall at home. And the mayor, the mayor of the town heard we were there and he came over, running over. I want to give a speech of thanks to these. You see what I'm saying? Our love for these people and we help their kids, it, it gives, an, it breaks down the barriers that they did not understand that nobody loved these, you know. But now we love them. We, we, we didn't ask anything else from them. We simply loved them, cared for them, and it goes through the whole town that Christians are, have helped our kids. So that's, I'm just thrilled, a lot of other things. One other thing, that I, I did a lot of repairs, a lot of construction when I was Af in Africa, which is why I did, I did well at uh, apartment management, because I could do electrical repairs, I could do plumbing repairs, et cetera, and I could paint. But one thing in Israel, our people do and fix up homes for elderly people. They'll paint their apartments when they got no money. They'll put, like, your, your rails here. You've got no rails on your stairs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I could hardly get up the stairs because I can't hang on to a rail. In, in Israel, in Israel, we put railings up on the apartment. Israel built lots of apartments, but they were built as cheaply as they could, right, to get a lot of people in them. And they built them without railings. They got their, their, their cement stairs go up to the first and the second and third floor, but no railings on the walls. And we go in and put railings in. And after we did, one lady, one lady thanked our people, and she cried, broke into tears and cried. Well, we didn't think it was a crying situation. And they asked, well, why are you crying? She said, because I'm old, my legs don't work, I haven't been out of my building in two years because I can't go down the stairs. But now you've put a railing and I can get outside again. That's why I'm crying. All I'm saying is, you know, a simple acts of love and, and gifts. Gift. There's a lot of other things that our mission does. But that's, uh, that's some of the just sample for you of that which we're doing to love Israel. Now, there are lots of magazines there at the back. And, uh, and they, are, they are free. These are... Douglas Young, when he set up the Bridges for Peace, he started this magazine, Dispatch from Jerusalem. Uh, you can pick up, pick up one for every family back there. Um, <clears throat> I wrote an article several years ago, a paper called Israel, the People and the Land. Uh, I may not have enough for all the families there, but you can pick up one of those. I hope you do, because it's the biblical basis for our love of Israel. Now, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm going to quit right now. I want to leave, read you scripture verses here, um, <clears throat> just, as I, I, just as, I, as I finish off here. Um, as if my wife is coming in a little, little while, to, to, we're going out to lunch. We're invited to a, a, a birthday party at 1 o'clock. <clears throat> anyway. Marriage, you know, my wife has been married and I've been married for 65 years. Marriage is a relationship in which one person is always right. 
and the other person is the husband. <laughs> I've been involved in uh, a lot of my a lot of my friends are passing away and going on to heaven ahead of me. One one lady in England, her husband passed away, and she wanted to be you know like a good wife put a, a good. Uh, statement on his uh, gravestone. So this is what she this is what she wrote on her on this is what she put on her husband's gravestone. Um, to follow you, I am content. Just wish I knew which way you went. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> Praise, praise the Lord. All of you here know, know how, to, how to get to heaven. I just love coming here. I love, I love the spirit of you people. God bless you as you serve him and as you pray for us. <laughs>